So today I'm joined with Gareth Benson from IP Assist, and we're just talking about um, in this post-COVID world, what is going to be the role for technology in going forward? Right. Well, that's right, Ben. You know, next Friday, we're actually hosting a boardroom, myself and Rob Vesey, who has been in the software game for over 22 years. Rob has built some remarkable platforms. For example, the Herald Sun. He uh, was, was the technician which actually uh, created the algorithms behind the Herald Sun's current advertising platform. That's just one example of the software solutions he has built. We're partnering together to encourage startups and business owners who may be in the software business to actually think about their strategy. Think about their strategy and blueprint forward uh, in, uh, in this post-COVID world in which uh, they can uh, navigate uh, towards a su successful commercialization outcome. That's one about software and systemic design, so how to create a map forward for your software solution. And then on the other side, it's about respecting and understanding the intellectual property that you're building and some mechanisms, some instruments such as patents and licensing, and even discussion about privacy and data, all these things that are very relevant for any software developer. So we encourage you to actually register in the event bright link below uh, for this boardroom, which runs 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. this, uh, yeah, this Friday. Uh, come and join us for a virtual cup of Nescafe. Oh, this is um, probably a good, uh, good case in um, software, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We've found, had a few tricks this morning, uh, despite wanting to, wanting to be customers. <laughs> Anyway, it is there in the Zoom meeting. If anyone doesn't have it, it is there in the Zoom chat box there. I'll also email it around through to everyone. And Rob, can you share your screen still? We got everyone back on the call. And we do have everyone back on the call. It's all good. Way to go, Rob. All right. So, I, where was I up to? I was up to techniques for uh, working out how to analyze it. So. One technique that we found very effective was to draw a floor plan of your office or your environment, something that represented all of the parties involved and all of the uh, areas so that people could visualise it and then effectively put transparency overlays and uh, Visio is very good, Microsoft Visio is very good for doing the, the overlays. Um, so you can see the person walking in, going to the counter um, staff member doing some stuff on, at the counter and then going into the back room to to work on it. Um, and so we can put these multiple layers of transparencies over in order to describe uh, both the existing processes and then rearrange them into what the desired processes would be. And so it's quite a good technique um, for getting an un <coughs> a bigger picture understanding of what your environment might be like. Um, so once you've got a lot of the understanding, you need to start prototyping um, your new ideas for how you're going to solve whatever you've identified. Um, prototyping, a lot of people try and jump into the, uh, the best solution as early as possible. Um, most of the time though, you want to actually qualify that your market is going to want to get to the other side to start with. And so you do that any way you can. Once you've established that there is someone making it a bit easier, um, we'll usually find a lot more nuance in what you're doing um, before finally you get to a paved situation where you know that this is what everybody wants. And if you, if you can automate it, you'll get a lot more people being able to run across it faster. And so they're the stages that you should look at. And there's a book made to stick, goes through that cycle very well. Um, it's worth having a look at. So now, as part of that prototyping stage, testing it, um, testing it both technically and with the market. This uh, 
flow on the on the right that I've put up is one that we worked through uh, with a business. We started off using Trello to do the big chunky. We have this large two month piece of work. Um, each one of those then broke down into a spreadsheet that described the work, um, costing sheets that worked out what was going to happen. We worked out how to push that data into Microsoft Project, which gave us a clear timeline, eventually into JIRA, which people could then get their work tickets from. And JIRA pointed them to Confluence, which is where they were going to enter their data in. And so this, we worked on this in the background to understand it and refine it and went through several iterations. It was a very complex problem we were trying to solve, but this gives you an idea of what the prototyping stage might look like and the fact that you don't need it perfect day one. You just need to prove a lot of the various concepts and understand um, from a process point of view what's required. Um, it also helps you identify your risks in the real world. So now that you have a reasonably clear picture of what your product is, is what benefit it's going to provide, how it's going to provide it, it's time to think about how you're going to, going to go about actually getting it to the market. Um, first stage is the business model that you choose to build around it. Because um, if it's just a product, it'll sit on the shelf forever and nobody will know about it. Nobody will be able to buy it. Nobody will be able to get support for it. So the obvious business model is to continue doing what you're doing um, and use it as a secret source or a way of uh, improving the operation of your people. Um, and it allows you to take on you know twice the number of clients with the same staff and it provides that that sort of uplift is the first strategy to employ um you might consider franchising or licensing the model so that other people can can pick it up and uh follow your processes follow your if it's baked into the software follow your software and so you can get you can leverage other people's effort and their their drive to scale your business a lot easier um, or you can license access to it as you see with traditional software um, most of the software anybody knows about is licensed um, but there's a lot more software sitting behind the scenes that people don't see that goes through other channels um, so, yeah, until a customer can discover and learn about something, um, and most importantly, you benefit from it, you don't have a business, you just have a technology sitting on the shelf. So, my primary recommended reading on this one is the e -Myth. Uh, It's It helps set the scene and for basically getting all of the slides getting to this point and get an understanding uh, how your processes are going to to work um, and how you, how you can go about thinking about your business in a different way. Uh, cloud enabled business models. If you are putting it into technology and putting it in the cloud, it changes the, the way you approach the business model. Um, it changes, it removes distance and time from the equation much better than just about anything else we've had today. So what you, what you end up with is the different parties that you may engage with mixed with the type of platform or the relationships that you're building up. Um, so our initial example of APS building a layout system. We had, we had a traditional business to business licensed software product. Now that the newspaper industry is shrinking rapidly, we're looking at changing that to being a result as a service system instead. So we'll put 
our core engine in the cloud and provide our competitors the ability to call on the functionality without being able to see how it's happened. Um, and so they can add our core secret source to their products um, on a licensed basis so that both parties can actually uh, benefit from that. And so that's something that we're um, starting to look at now or have been considering for a while, but now have the, uh, the catalyst to go and do. So the others listed here, um, Resource and Lane Tory are both platform as a service. They enable entire organisations to look at a common store of data as opposed to um, normal business to business software, which is like Word or Excel or any of those where it's, it's more siloed isolation, one person at a time. Um, these are everybody works on the same data set and grows the complete picture together. Um, and so it's a different way of thinking about the software. Um, orders on the go and uh, eat by design. We've got um, multi, uh, enabling multi-party relationships. So it's more than, it's not siloed to a, to a single customer. It's actually connecting multiple customers together around a transaction or a functionality that they that they're offering and so that provides a much stronger um, stronger story for keeping them in the marketplace because both parties are interacting once it's a lot harder to get it up and running because you've got to get both sides engaged but it's once you have gone over that hurdle it sticks a lot longer because both parties are gaining benefit from it and you get a network effect. So once you've got decided on the business model and the way that you're going to, the way that your technology is going to be utilised, the key consideration is how you're going to charge for it. Um, there's, if you get, it's the key friction point is how am I going to pay for it and who's going to pay for it can drastically change how many people sign up and how many people uh, keep going with it. Um, and so the one that really brought this home to me was Eat by Design, where we started out looking at, so Eat by Design is a platform that connects nutritionists with their customers who have dietary issues like diabetes. And initially we were looking at a provider pays for the service and uses it to interact with their customers sort of a model. And that was okay, but it wasn't until we went through and really looked at it and played around with ideas and came to the, came to the conclusion that if we reverse that and had the end customer pay for the, for the provider to plan their meals on an ongoing basis every week. Um, the customer has to learn how to eat better and has to learn uh, nutrition. And if they can be in constant contact around the meal plan with the provider, the customer can pay and the com provider can earn from the platform. The flow of money changed the entire equation and turned the provider from someone we had to go and hassle a lot to being our primary sales channel to the customers. And that one switch has changed the way we built the software and has changed uh, the business model that we're going to go into. And so it's worth looking through the different options um, of where where is the cash flow coming from? Who are we actually going to charge? And as I've said, if all else fails, fall back on advertising. Um, but that's getting harder and harder these days to, to make a dollar from. So then finally, we get to the let's make it happen. We've got enough of a plan. We've proved that it's a good idea. 
We know how we're going to sell it. We know who's going to buy it. We know where the money's coming from. So we're now in a position to start engaging with other people and making the funding stage happen first. So you've decided that, okay, we do need to automate this. It is going to be a bigger project. Um, you know, a lot of businesses can pause at this point and just use the process changes in their business and see a huge uplift. Um, for those that do go and automate, you usually need to work out uh, how you're going to pay for it, whether you're going to hire the staff, whether you're going to outsource um, or what that's going to look like. Um, so funding it becomes very critical. Self-funding methods um, is the most common, is use your existing sales and savings um, to fund the R&D effort. The R&D tax concession is a great way of continuing that going. Um, if you're solo, then paying for it using a day job um, or creating a consulting version of the product um, or of the, the result and charging premium clients the consulting rates while you're getting the rest of the picture together um, provides value both in getting getting a cash flow, but it also allows you to get more learning and more experience from the customer um, when you're learning about what you should do um, and using the Wizard of Oz technique to be the man behind the curtain, pedaling really hard um, while everything's looking great um, on top. Uh, you can go for investment. Everybody starts out going for venture capital. They think that's what, what they need because all the movies talk about it. It's probably one of the least likely outcomes for the majority of ventures. Um, it also, a lot of them fail because they get, because the motivation of the venture capitalist is to get a return, a return of 10 times their money in five to 10 years, um, which doesn't usually play well with people's business model and objectives. And so when it does play well, it's, it's an ideal match. When it doesn't play well, it can destroy a business. Um, and we've seen both of those scenarios play out for, our, for um, some of our customers over time. So one of the new ones that's worth bringing up, uh, just because last night it finished, uh, was Gig Super. One of our customers has just finished the first crowd equity raise that we've we've seen. Um, they ended up at 160,000 and 150 shareholders, most of which will also be customers of theirs. So it's a very good uh, way of getting funding and establishing a customer base of loyal customers. It also has the value of proving um, that the market wants it so that other investors um, in the list feel a lot more comf confident investing in the next round because 160,000 is going to allow them to do a lot of marketing and get a lot of traction, but they're going to need a lot more than that over the next few years in order to hit their break even and grow targets. So now they have 160 um, people behind them they're more likely to get either corporate sponsorship or, or angel investment. Um, and in fact, I think they were going to be on the call, but they apologised and said they've got calls they have to do. Um, now, that, now that their raise is finished. So that's been a really interesting journey. Um, so now that you've funded it, building it, we finally get to the point that everybody goes, I've got an idea, let's build it. Um, and they forget all the steps I've just been through. So I could talk forever about this. Um, it's you know the thing I actually know something about. And what I wanted to leave today is that as the leader and as the person going through this process, building it is a risk management strategy. and. The key things I wanted you to, to take away 
was there are core stages that you need to go through. Most people focus on the design and the construction stages. Um, design is how pretty is it going to look? How's the user going to interact with it? And then writing the code. Um, you also need to think about the architecture. So design says here's 50% of the pieces of the puzzle. Architecture says how are all those pieces going to fit together and what does the rest of the puzzle look like? Um, engineering breaks down the problem and and works through what code should be what code should be written before you go and write it. Um, you have you will be going through a release trial and tuning stage after you've developed your your first version. Um, the tuning stage is pr pretty much the most critical one for you connecting with your user base. Um, done properly it can create evangelists within your within your users and the best way to do that is to include their suggested feature in your product if they can look at it and point at it and go that was my idea you have an evangelist for life and so part of that tuning is also engaging with the market and so that's a critical thing and one of one of the key success factors that we had for APS early on getting that getting that um traction and in fact tanya um now works for us because she was so thrilled that we listened to her about what the product should do um support and continuous improvement the the chessboard is moving so fast all the pieces around you are moving so fast you will have a continuous um support and features coming in and new ideas and new demands from your customers um, so as you're thinking about this factor for the fact that that is going to happen it's not i've built it and now i can sit back and and just let it run um, that doesn't happen so when you're going for funding everything i've just described should be no more than 50 percent of your planned budget um, Early on, we had some clients that took whatever number we suggested um, and asked for that much from investors um, that they struggled in the next stage because they're unable to um, fund the subsequent steps. Um, a few points on the methodology. There's a lot of evangelism and a lot of people going on about Agile at the moment. Um, Agile is a good strategy for small projects where the development team understands the entirety of the picture. So if you're saying, oh, let's build a to-do list uh, on your phone, everybody knows about that, everybody understands that. It's all, um, it's all quite clear. But if you say, right, let's build an aircraft, no amount of agile is going to get you to build that aircraft. It's just not going to happen. You need a lot more process. There's a lot more people involved. There's a lot more different specialities and the people building it have no capacity to understand the entire picture in its intricate detail. And so you need supporting infrastructure process and technology to make a more complex thing happen and so really it's picked the right tool for the job um, complexity in software builds is what will kill a project the fastest so that can be complexity of the technology complexity of the business and the process that you're trying to build in um, the more boundary cases and weird stuff you have the harder it is to get everybody understanding and ensuring that the technology is built the right way um, and the number of people involved in the pro process if you've got three or four people they can all sit around the table and talk flat out and get to a common understanding if you've got 15 people spread across you know several offices um, there's a lot more relationships and understanding and different points of view 
that have got to be understood and expressed. And so the complexity as you grow is the thing that most often technically kills projects um, if it's not, you know, the market doesn't accept it or you run out of money or all the other reasons which are usually more common. But, yeah, complexity will kill a project. Uh, choose the right tool for the job. Uh, you'll have a lot of technology guys go on about, you know, my favourite my favorite platform or, you know, it's got to be Java, it's got to be .NET, it's got to be whatever buzzword. Generally, it doesn't. Um, generally, they're good enough and it's the capability of the people wielding the tool over the, over the capability of the tool itself for the vast majority of cases. There's always exceptions um, and knowing why you've chosen a technology is important. Fantastic, Rob. Look, there's some great detail there. Um, we've you've got sell it, and then we maybe we can have a quick, uh, uh, quick um, discussion about. That's sell. right. I was up to the thank you anyway. No, no, not at all. <laughs> I'll just uh, yeah, all good, all good. You so, Last last slide is sell it. Um, I'll do a high speed version of sell it. So now you've got to work out how to sell it. So this, the the. Um, this is going to consume the majority of the rest of your budget that you haven't put into the build. Um, and what I've got is on the right, the final plan. Uh, this is red gums from about eight years ago. Um, and it's not what we do anymore, but it was the plan at the time. And so we, st uh, we started off saying, who are we targeting and who is the best, most likely candidate what are we going to offer them? How do we find them? How do we, um, who is the ideal profile? Um, and then we get into this separation of all of these stages from the customers never heard about us and how they're going to find out through these, through these steps down to they've signed the contract and let's get on with it. Um, and so this is going to look different for every business. Um, each of these, each of the colours represents a different perspective segment of our market or different type of customer. And each of the boxes represents an activity like an email or a report or a, a, a blog post that goes out that is going to engage them somehow. And so working through that entire process, um, I worked with, with a guy named Hugh who's changed his business to Align.me and it's... Um, it was a really good process. It took me about two or three days with him to come up with this um, and it set the scene. After that, you go through all of the, that'll set up what you do in all of the engagement website analytics um, because you now know what you're tracking for. So planning out your sales strategy is um, a critical step um, that those of us on the technical side generally gloss over. Um, so I wanted to leave you with that. All right. Questions. Fantastic. <laughs> really, really good. Um, look, we've got uh, we've only got about thirty five minutes left on the on our entire session. Oh, sorry. One, one question that I I'll ask because it would be a good bridge to IP, <laughs> Rob. And and certainly I know you're available for a lot more detailed discussion. We can probably even shoot the slides across. Uh, as well to everyone on the call. But how important is that planning stage, Rob, just in terms of uh, commercialization strategy? How important is that from your perspective? Um, the planning stage is critical. Well, from an IP perspective, it, the intellectual property, most people assume it's somewhere in the code that my guys write. And in general, it's not. It's in the process and the planning that you do is where your intellectual property actually resides. The, the code is just an expression of what you've decided to do. And so for you, if you're going to, you know, work with Gareth um, on what do you protect, you're protecting, your, you're protecting the knowledge and the processes and the understanding that you've gained 
um, through the process and the software, there may be some aspects that you want to protect, but in general, it's not the interesting bit. Fantastic. So I think it's critical. Yeah, yeah, critical. Planning, planning. I think that's the thing that will resonate across both these areas, which relate is that it's, it's, it's actually it was fantastic getting the detail, giving you a considerable experience, Rob, because, um, you know, I, I, I can see it's, it's very similar from IP. You know, you need to build, you need to, like a building, you need to lay the foundations and ensure that the foundations are strong in order to, to build any project um, in order to, to, to leverage it and sell it. So the strategy and the commercialization strategy, I think uh, whether you're um, building the code or whether you're building your own intellectual property, they are one and the same. Look, I, I might just jump in at this point at IP, just and then we can hang around for anyone that's got the time for any further questions. But thanks again, Rob. That was that's great. Right. So this is just a, a sort of can carry on in some respects, I think, um, just to make sure that you can see the screen okay, Rob? Can you, yep. Yep. Okay, yep. excellent. Um, yeah, basically, um, I, I'd like to, to pick off where Rob, um, Rob's great growth discussion started uh, in really talking a little bit more now at detail of intellectual property. Um, and much of this comes from a perspective of, of how, what will it actually take to reach the summit of your ideas. Most of you on the call are, um, are on that journey um, uh, and, uh, and certainly climbing the mountain. Um, the perspectives I want to lend today are just about ways that we can help uh, to assist you on that journey on, on the, to the summit of your ideas and really focusing today rather than an explanation of intellectual property and uh, which most of you have probably some understanding of is really about as Rob says about building a commercialization strategy to make sure that, that you've got uh, a secure sales pipeline at the end of this. If you're already building it, that's fantastic, but it's only going to be as successful as your next customers. And we want to see you achieve that success with a thorough understanding of the foundations of intellectual property. So let's just begin that. What is intellectual property? Basically, um, I'll be talking about this from the perspective of the World Intellectual Property Organization, because these are also a strong partner uh, for your uh, future success. You, I imagine the impact that most of you want to receive, receive are actually about uh, or having that the traction of your software go worldwide. So understanding intellectual property from the perspective of the world intellectual property organization is also very important. Um, so you can leverage your ideas uh, to a global scale. And IP from the world intellectual property organization WIPO is it's an area of law which enables people to earn recognition or financial benefit from what they invent or create okay and this is everyone on this call or most everyone is in the business of this okay and uh, that requires just an understanding of patents trademarks copyright um, and most importantly of all, the, the, the forgotten part of all this many times I have found is actually about contracts and how you actually then leverage, license or franchise these ideas for your commercial success. Rob touched on that in his talk today too, in how you can actually build a successful business model. And that's why I, um, I'm really going to focus on that touch point. It's really about commercialization. Your intellectual property um, does need to be protected uh, at, at a stage. It's not necessarily from the outset, but you do need to have an IP and commercialization strategy. And investors will want to see this. Investors will want to know how they plan to get a return from their investment. And more often than that, that is an investment in your intellectual property strategy. On the other side, you need to have a commercialization strategy, as Rob touched on at the, at the end of his talk today. It's 11 o'clock. Which, which we call a commercialization strategy. It's the overall plan of action designed to achieve the long-term aim of the commercialization of the venture. It's great if you can build it, but if people don't come and pay for it, then where is your, uh, where is, how can you leverage this for your own business success? Okay, now this strategy is critical to the prospects of the venture, as Rob finished off today. It may be adapted and it will likely change like most roadmaps do. However, 
Some of the key questions to consider when determining this strategy include, how does your proposed software fit with established uh, a core business interest of, of those who are investing in it or for, the, for your customers? Who will want it and why is it better than those of the alternative? Look, I'm not a soft, I don't build software, but I can only just see it here with Zoom and other um, technologies I'm involved in, which includes uh, augmented reality. I can see even though Zoom has had a massive peak and uptake, but this technology is still limited and will change as time changes. And, the, and we have seen that just in, in the age of, you know, from the dot-com boom through to now, how quickly things can change in terms of platforms and, and software alternatives. Um, so uh, knowing the market, knowing how you're going to, who, who your competitors are and knowing what your advantage, what your key uh, advantage is over others is really important to where and by whom it will be sold. Okay. So that, that's really the thrust of the talk. It's about commercializing your success. And now we're just gonna drill into some small pieces of, of IP law, just so you've got a good understanding of what it is when you build uh, your IP and commercialization strategy. I've also included a handout. I emailed that through to everyone. You feel free to use this as a worksheet and to note down uh, and jot down some notes as you go, because I find that this material has uh, a lot more um, relevance and potency to you when you actually apply it to your own business rather than theoretical concepts. And so look, um, feel free to do that. And I'm happy to talk to people about this and often do to assist them further. Copyright is really about identity. Now, copyright is like the oxygen that we breathe. We breathe in and out copyright every day, particularly now that we're in a fourth industrial revolution dot com age. Uh, whether it's sharing uh, social media uh, uh, or um, or in in in, in absor absorbing customer data, which is happening every day in many of businesses and many of your businesses, what we need to understand, of course, is copyright is identity. It is a non-registrable right, um, unlike other forms of intellectual property, and it exists as a bundle of economic rights, which gives you the owner the exclusive right to own the intellectual property it creates. Um, it's automatic and it is upon creation of the work. Okay, there is no need to register this work on an official register. Now in the data world that we now live, copyright is not simply your marketing material or your website, it contains that. But more, now more than ever, we, you may be creating data which is copyright. I mean, the simple way to think about this is your database has a, is actually a copyright. You know, there is a value to it. And if you were to one day grow your business and sell it along with the data or even furthermore have deals related to the data, we'll get into data and privacy right at the end here, you need to understand that that has a legal right to you as an owner, copyright, but also you need to also recognise that you may be dealing with data from other third parties that they have a right to. So really understanding, having a fundamental understanding of copyright is really about also developing a good strategy around it. I mean, the visible copyright can be protected with a copyright symbol, but also, as noted before, it is in the commercial deals you do, the contracts, the copyright, who really have a commercial value to you. So understanding what it is as an asset is very, very important in the growth of what your business is, and most of the people on the call are in businesses where they're growing intellectual property. Okay, so that's just some fundamental in copyright. I am gonna to touch also on patents. Okay, there is a bit of a, a misnomer that you cannot uh, record, you know, create patent, uh, create a patent out of software. Now that's not necessarily true. In fact, we have client clients that we assist on the investment pathway who do actually patent and can gain patents for their software just depending on what patent they choose, that actually helps them and benefits them uh, in, uh, in getting investors on board. But let's just understand broadly what a patent is, okay? Patents have been around for a long time. Throughout the third industrial revolution, patents actually help um, enforce legal rights for a device, substance, method, or process. Normally, it's about having a new, useful, and inventive or innovative step. The key here is also it includes innovative step, and this is where software typically falls. 
okay? When granted, a patent will give you an exclusive commercial right to your invention or can help in that fundraising process and be innovative as you explore the full um, uh, scope of how, how your invention may be commercialized. And that's the more clever use of patents rather than trying to you know, own the entirety of the world, this world idea. An innovation patent can sometimes be a more sensible choice because it allows you to grow your business, secure it as you grow, and it can change as time, as time changes. Unlike a standard patent, which lasts 20 years, which let's face it, in this now fourth industrial revolution world, is never going to completely protect a, an idea because the world's changing, as Rob said, you know, there is many changes afoot uh, and they're gonna move quickly. Um, an innovation patent or even a provisional patent, which is only a year long, uh, can assist you better to commercialize your business rather than that standard patent of 20 years which is very expensive as well. The standard and the innovation patents are a lot cheaper, okay? Um, so just broadly speaking, um, we might just, I'll just demonstrate you. I like to tell this story because it really does demonstrate the importance of protecting your intellectual property. And I also often refer to um, having worked for this organisation as well, CSIRO, a wonderful uh, organisation that has helped push um, science and research in this country. However, probably one of the biggest commercialisation faux pas that uh, CSIRO made was actually in not uh, protecting their most valuable asset. Um, they finally did patent this, but in, uh, they, in the early days, um, they actually let the patent on this escape and it resulted in a very lengthy court battle. Um, CSIRO were actually uh, responsible for developing uh, the YLAN technology, which is a fundamental part of wireless. However, they didn't uh, protect it. It actually was a, uh, three radio astronomers that came up with it. Um, however, due to, and I can vouch for this, having worked within the culture of CSIRO, their uh, lack of focus on commercialization, they didn't even record it and they did not protect it. And it was an American company that actually gained, and re uh, uh, gained the rights and patented the rights in the US and commercialized it to a billion dollar business. There was a lengthy litigation battle that ensured uh, and they did settle, um, however, um, that was not worth the cost. Um, so well, from a science, uh, intellectual property and software perspective, it does pay to explore your options around patenting, okay? And just in summary on patents, there's three different types. The provisional patent, which actually sets a priority date. Um, it is valued by investors, it lasts a year, it's not as at all cost as costly as a standard patent, um, and it, it is an option for you in your commercialization strategy. Likewise, an innovation patent, uh, not as strong as the standard patent, but for software and technology can also be very, very useful for you because it protects a new and innovative step rather than an inventive step, okay? And I actually highly recommend exploring one and two. We have working with us um, a patent attorney. His name is Steve Davey. Um, Steve is also an entrepreneur. He's also a software developer and he has like, successfully registered his own software and commercialized also a cloning company um, and sold that company. So he is an entrepreneur. He's also a lawyer, a patent attorney, and he drafts patents every day. And he specializes in software patents. So that brings me to this third bundle of economic rights, just as a basic understanding for you. Now this one, this is kind of what triggered Rob and I to sort of um, also uh, uh, share a, an information session today, because we really recognize that while um, all the one, you know, very clever people that are um, building excellent businesses um, uh, have uh, and are very, varying stages of their cycle. Many of them have, a, have missed the most obvious kind and most visible kind of intellectual property, um, which uh, every business owner, I believe, should be considering protecting, particularly if they've been around for more than two or three years. And that is relates to trademarks. Now, most of you would be familiar with this gentleman here. 
And uh, Mr. Richard Branson is a, a great indicator of an entrepreneur who recognises the value of trademarks. Just back on that, a trademark is uh, protects your brand. Basically, you would not jump out of a plane without a parachute. And why, why people are jumping into business without protecting their most visible asset continually uh, astounds me because it is your most visible intellectual property. It is your brand. It is the time and resources that you have spent several years in many people's cases in building their enterprise. Therefore, it, it is, it is um, you know, it deserves your attention to protecting this as a brand in the marketplace. Now, one person that knows the value of this um, is, of course, Richard Branson. He, um, I find the Virgin trademark very, very interesting because it, he has about 126 trademarks at last count. And that's just his testimony to the number of different industries that he has leveraged the, the brand Virgin since the 1960s into. Um, in fact, he relies on the power of his brand to break into new industries. So therefore, that brand has a very significant value to him. Um, the other thing that we need to know of the power of trademarks is that it actually protects you in uh, over 45 different uh goods and services. IP Australia that actually um, is responsible for the registration of patents, designs and trademarks has 45 different categories. So it's really important to understand what category your trademark and subclass your trademark can fit into. Now the interesting thing about Virgin is that he actually has registered in almost every one of the 45 different goods and services because he's been in everything from music to cola through to, um, you know, obviously space, uh, you know, some commercialization of space even. So the, 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 the Virgin brand has a significant net worth and I'm sure you, you could see and agree with that. It, this is, uh, process is also about understanding that your brand, as you grow, will also have a significant net worth. And an investment in your trademark and the early stages of your business is actually investment in the next 10 years because the registration lasts for 10 years. And quite simply, um, it is also an asset of your business. It's known as an intangible asset. It is known as the goodwill of your business. And if you are selling in taking on investor money, it's also what your investor is investing in. Uh, when you get into franchising, uh, leveraging and licensing the value of your brand is also very, very important, but it's going to begin on the ground floor, which is protecting that as an asset. Okay. It's uh, essentially under the Trademarks Act 1995. It's a sign used in business to indicate that goods or services come from a particular trader or service provider. It can include words, letters, names, signatures, colors, even smells. Um, Cadbury, he was, uh, there's a case of the Cadbury Purple being defended in the UK for its use because of their registration of their trademark. But um, quite simply, in your case, uh, and many businesses on the call, if you are looking to go international, registration of your trademark in Australia is very, very important to gain access to the Madrid Protocol through, administered through the World Economic Forum, which will then allow you to protect it in an, over 118 countries worldwide. But you need to have the trademark registered in your home country first. So I do recommend that people get onto that as an activity because it's an investment in the next 10 years of your business. Okay, we're making some good time, so um, which will leave some time for both Rob and I to answer any questions. But I did want to give you uh, an example of one of our software clients um, uh, who we've been working with for over three years. Uh, this is an entrepreneur named Michael Ma who is, has developed a workforce management platform. Uh, it is now under the name of One Passport. He actually had four components um, to his platform and he has gone down um, the capital raising path and he is basically supplies a product called One Passport, which is a workforce management platform. This is basically a design for industries uh, with a mobile workforce and to assist them with regulatory compliance. 
he actually started with nursing homes um, and looking at ways that he could solve problems and in the nursing home industry, you know, particularly with uh, credentials and of employees. And the software began by there and he's built a number of other HR solutions. His clients now include the Queensland government. He, uh, he also licenses this software to education, uh, RTOs, for example, uh, who use that software to ensure the credentialing of their teachers. Um, but it also extends that to labor hire as well. But he went on this journey most re recently in his second capital raise uh, because, again, it was very important for him to protect this software, which he's now charging out for an enterprise level around $5,000 a license uh, fee. So obviously his intellectual property has significant worth. And this has all been in the last three years. So he has got his IP in order and it began with protecting his trademark. In fact, he's got four trademarks. This includes one passport, also his human resource solution, HR and Cage, Care HR, Q, Care HQ, and Shaw Comply is actually the business behind it, Shaw Comply Technology. So he's registered that. Just to note also, the value of uh, the TM and the R symbol are often, um, can often be confused in the Australian marketplace. But even once you've com commenced a trademark application, which takes at least seven and a half months for uh, IP Australia to approve, uh, you can use the TM symbol. And this can actually be a very important strategic move to make uh, in the early stages while you're still getting um, your trademark sorted. The reason being is that having your, your intellectual property protected and using these symbols is actually equivalent to, 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 to putting a ring fence around your property. It's like uh, you wouldn't last long if you left the front door of your home open um, you know, overnight uh, or even for weeks at a time. It'd be just inviting people to come in and to potentially look at reverse engineering or, or taking your property. So using the TM symbol uh, can actually show your intention of a pending trademark uh, and protect your brand in the marketplace and legally speaking once it's a registered trademark you can use the R symbol which is recognized internationally. The other part um, of this commercialization conversation uh, is of course around license agreements. License agreements are your contracts, it's the way you leverage your intellectual property. I'm going to mention two today uh, particularly with respect to end user license agreements. Now, most of the poor people on the call will need to use a license agreement for the use of their intellectual property, whether you're giving that software around, out for free or charging money for it. In the end of the day, you need to have a consideration around who is the end user license and what the terms of those agreements are, because that's the way you're actually going to leverage your intellectual property. Um, so uh, the other one that often comes up and certainly in this case as well is software as a service that can also be extremely complex agreement but of course there's a consideration if you're actually prov providing other services on top of the use of the software which is again a use of your intellectual property because normally it could include consulting services or, uh, or other services that you're offering. All of these things are vehicles or instruments that leverage your intellectual property. And these need particular close consideration if you haven't already done so. Finally, just as an illustration of the way that one and Michael used their innovation patent, uh, yeah, they, they gained an innovation patent. He actually and has registered this international, internationally. Uh, he has had a patent drafted which allows uh, him to protect um, this uh, this patent and this idea, which is a system allowing individuals to create and maintain their own personal record, um, and the, the drafting of the patent, uh, you know, is around the multiple uh, people that are able to connect using the service, and this is the system that the individual connects to. This was drafted by again by Steve, our patent attorney, and this uh, now is protected internationally, allowing Michael now to move from the Australian marketplace leverage internationally in, in um, protecting his idea. 
Just finally, a word about privacy and data protection. This is going to be such a growing area of law and it touches on intellectual property. And I believe everyone should have a, just a basic understanding of how and what it is. Most of you are in the business uh, in software of dealing with other parties' data, maybe creating data yourself or, or, or having and handling third party data. Well, just some of the basic things you need to understand um, or, or and you need to have in place is that under the Privacy Act 1988, that every business needs to have a privacy policy which deals with their intellectual, uh, deals with the, uh, how they're handling um, other people's privacy information. Okay, and that policy should be on your website and it's actually a legal requirement that every business have that in place. The other thing that should be acknowledged in the emerging trends and, um, of, of data and, and, and data privacy is the Australian Information Commissioner. It's a regulatory body responsible for client compliance and enforcement of the privacy laws there. I've known personal, if, uh, I've, got, I've had clients who have, have been in breach of the, this before because one of their employees has accidentally let for example, this particular business was in medical medical information slip and a complaint was made and an OAICD, uh, the Australian Information Commissioner, made an investigation. Some of the things they'll look at is your compliance with Privacy Act, whether you've got a privacy policy and how you handle that information, okay? So it is it serves you to just be aware of the concept of data sovereignty. You need to know where this data is coming from, what you're able to do with it. And just finally on this, because it is going to be a growing area, I believe the future of blockchain is really about rescuing privacy back to into the hands of the consumer. Um, but so understanding where the law is at now in terms of data and privacy is very, very important. And there was a big move, which I believe singles the change and trends towards the future of data privacy. And that happened on the 25th of May, 2018, where the GDPR, which is uh, in the European Union, um, found, a, uh, found a, made a ruling basically, uh, that EU citizens should be informed of how businesses collect, use, share, secure, and process their data. You might recall that all the updates for cookies updates that you got were uh, in terms of conditions uh, you know about two years ago um, in fact almost to the day um, well, yeah two years ago it all happened was that they were overnight if you've got customers in the EU you are actually by their laws um, obligated to have a policy in relation to how you use should share secure and process personal data um, so if you're already selling overseas you need to make sure that your privacy policy includes uh, how you use, share, secure, and process personal data. Okay, that's some of the, one of the things that we've been helping a lot of businesses with as they have had to become GDPR compliant. Something to, to consider. And I believe that this is a signal towards the trends of how we actually will, will, will have more obligations imposed on us as business owners as to how we actually treat people's data. Okay, and just finally, to bring this to a close, to, to help you and assist you um, reach the summit of your ideas, this is really where the World Intellectual Property Organization has a number of treaties. Having your, your, and understanding the power of your own intellectual property in your home country will allow you to leverage it into others. And that's through the power of several instruments uh, that can then leverage your patents, your copyright, and even your trademark. I mentioned the Madrid Protocol before, but the same goes for patents. If you are registered in your home country, you can utilize um, the, uh, the international network provided by the World Economic Forum through the World Intellectual Property Organization to register in other countries. And it is a way that your IP protection and commercialization strategy can scale. Okay, so that's really uh, it. There is some great uh, free information available on ipaustralia.gov.au in any of these areas that I've touched on today. We spend a lot of time talking and educating. We love hosting events and sharing uh, information. Uh, and, um, and certainly we believe that education empowerment, so knowing where your uh, rights lie means that you're in a much better pay 
uh, place to build and then sell uh, the mountain of your dreams and your ideas as Rob finished on as well. By the way, we do have a very special offer just in terms of anyone on the call today. We're happy to spend some time with you in going over the worksheet. Um, in any of the areas um, that discussed, we're happy to set up a Zoom time with you. Please feel free to email me if you'd like to take us up on that offer, just so you've got a thorough understanding of where your idea sits in terms of in developing a sound commercialization and um, IP strategy. So that's, uh, that's us, by the way, there's Steve and Claire in Sydney. Um, and thank you very much for your time. So I think we've, uh, well, we think we're just finishing uh, on that positive note um, with a couple of minutes to go. Do we have any questions for either Rob or myself? Well, it's Peter here. Um, I've got a remark. First of all, thank you very much for um, organizing this and also for Rob for uh, touching on a lot more things than just developing some software uh, because that really is key as I found out the hard way over the past couple of years. Um, there's one thing, Gareth, I wanted to um, expand on from what you said about patents. You touched on it, but I don't know whether people are actually um, fully understanding of what is going on there. Um, patents are... Um, essentially lodged in different jurisdictions. So you can lodge a patent in Australia and that's great and you will have protection in Australia once that patent has been granted. It doesn't do anything for you in any of the other jurisdictions in the world. So if you want protection in Europe, uh, the States, Canada or whatever, you will have to apply for patents in those jurisdictions. And yes, Gareth, it is bloody expensive. Look, it can be. Yeah, I'm not denying that, Peter. Yeah, let me let me answer your question. Basically, um, it uh, I think it begins like uh, we've been discussing about strategy. It's not suggesting you should go out and spend fifty thousand dollars on a standard patent, which some people mm -hmm. and I don't agree with that. Let me make it just very very clear. It's more important to have a strategy around it. Um, and there are more opportunities than just the standard patent, as I mentioned in my talk today. Mm -hmm. There's the provisional patent, which lasts for one year as you're going towards commercialization. Um, we've seen clients use that successfully. And then there's an innovation patent, which actually lasts only eight years. Now, both of those are, are much more affordable options. Um, and again, it will come down to intention. It depends where you're at in the journey and what you're seeking to protect. The third point I'll just make on that, Peter, is that, as I mentioned just at the end of the talk there, if you are looking to register in international countries, it's going to serve you to register in your own country first and then use the Madrid Protocol, such as through the Paris Cooperation Treaty, to go to, say, a country like Canada. If your strategy is the US at the same time, it may serve you to go through those options because you can register once and be covered in several countries at the same time, and therefore that brings the cost right down. But every person's uh, and enterprise's situation is different. So really, both what Rob and I have been suggested today is it's your strategy is key, okay? And that's what we like to discuss from the outset with clients, because it's about making sure that you've got a roadmap that is tailored to your, your needs. Does that help, Peter? I think it does, Gareth. I mean, we've been down this road now for a good couple of years, and yes, we have got patents in various okay. jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. However, with what you've just mentioned, I would like to have a, a brief chat with you, if at all possible, because sure. I get the funny feeling that we'd be missing some key information that would have saved us pocket loads of money. So, <laughs> look, uh, I yeah, I am happy to have that discussion, and, and I hope I'm not going to be bringing. But those Collins Street law firms are not uh, generous in their offering of, of of strategy, and some of them are just don't operate like this. People like Steve and ourselves. I mean, not to defend, we don't go. No, I'm not defending them at all because we work. We're entrepreneurs. We are building businesses, and therefore we feel that it's a a need to, to have the strategy in place. I have heard plenty of stories of Collins Street law firms charging $50,000 to clients at the outset, which is not, does not serve the entrepreneur. So Peter, happy to have that discussion. Happy to have a, a 
for, for people like yourself, sometimes it serves to do an IP audit just to see where your IP is at, including what patents you've got. And there are things you can do uh, much like other areas of business, such as insurance or, um, or otherwise where you can restructure your finance, where you can restructure your needs. You know, maybe that's something you want to consider, but it begins by understanding what you've got. So that's the kind of conversation that I'd have with you, Peter. Okay, brilliant. Thank okay, you, Gareth. not a problem at all. Anyone else uh, for either Rob or myself? Um, That's a quick question. Can you touch on a little bit more about trademarks? How much they roughly cost and things like that? Sure. Well, trademarks, I think most of uh, the protection of intellectual property should begin there because it's your most visible brand. Look, roughly speaking, we have a service. We do uh, trademarks uh, for around a thousand, uh, just under a thousand dollars. Uh, to manage the entire process for you, which is identifying all the, the goods and services. Um, and there is a small cost of $250 per category, which is disbursement to IP Australia. Generally, it's about a grand and a half. And that is an investment, Michael, in the next 10 years of your brand. Okay. And I'm sure that you would agree that your brand is going to be worth a lot more than that, you know, over 10 years. But that's so the relative investment of protecting your intellectual property. Um, versus what it's worth is again a minimal cost um, you know for the growth of the next 10 years of your business thank you appreciate that not a problem anyone else Jeff I know you're in the area of risk management and and did you have a comment maybe on Rob's presentation on, on how people can manage their risk yeah look we um we're doing a, quite a bit in uh, intellectual property from the perspective of unintentional infringement of it, if you're exposed to that. So we are doing a lot of work with the CSIRO and others uh, through my business. Uh, we do a lot of work with life science, biotech and pharma. And obviously those guys uh, can, do feel threatened sometimes by um, uh, patents and the unintentional infringement of them. Um, Having a dedicated insurance solutions around that um, is a really effective way to support the business continuity if you are walking a fine line around uh, intellectual property uh, or there's allegations that you've infringed someone else's. Uh, similarly, uh, whilst that's all about defence, um, we've also created a product we were the first to bring to Australia, uh, IP enforcement. So it doesn't exist in Australia. We, we work with Lloyds in London uh, what IP enforcement does is uh, a business who is creating IP, uh, whether it's life science, software, tech, or others, uh, you can take out um, a policy that will uh, pursue your rights against others. So it effectively acts as a war chest. Um, where that's been effective is if you're a smaller provider and you really can't finance litigation against others uh, who potentially are uh, infringing your, your rights or... or um, or uh, infringing your, your own intellectual property. This particular uh, policy basically gives uh, your pursuit rights to the insurer to go and enforce and protect your intellectual property against others. So um, that, that's uh, obviously different from normal insurance where we think of you know, covering our compensation or legal costs and defense. This is actually enforcement and pursuit. So quite an innovative solution. Um, we're seeing IP um, obviously increasing and everything sort of wrapped around that. There are um, a lots of dedicated uh, insurance policies around that to, um, to protect the business, uh, just in case there is an um, allegation. So one of the trends, uh, disturbingly, that we've seen um, in my business for some of our clients is uh, patent trolls, uh, organisations that actually secure their own intellectual property to then go and enforce it uh, for profit. So we've had a couple of clients who have, received some pretty ordinary letters um, from patent trolls, or I, well, that's what I call them, um, these third parties that uh, literally just throw out a number saying, um, you must, uh, we've noticed this on your, on your website or your content or your software, um, please uh, pay us a license fee of $37,000 or we'll pursue further action. Um, that can obviously spook a few um, clients, uh, particularly if you're an early stage venture. Thankfully, if they've got a policy, um, uh, most civil liability professional indemnity policies will respond and they can actually get some pretty good legal support up front. Um, 
covered by the insurance, which is, you know, some of those policies are less than a couple of thousand dollars a year. So, um, yeah, I think business continuity, intellectual property, that's where I um, encounter it quite a bit, Gareth. Yeah, fantastic, Jeff. There's some interesting perspectives there. So I'm just conscious of time and, um, and you've all been very patient in listening to us uh, for uh, a little over an hour and a half. Rob, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to uh, add um, while we wrap up for the day? Um, no, I think it's, again, the strategy and protecting it. There's a few things you mentioned that I wasn't aware of um, in the painting options. Um, and we might have to have a chat about what qualifies as a, um, what was the second patent type? So there's the provisional patent, then there's the innovation patent. Which innovation is patent, that's the one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what that is, because I, I haven't looked at those before. So I think um, there might be some, some options there for, for people I'm developing for. That was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, uh, I guess in summary uh, today, uh, then it's really about um, building the, you need to build the bridge and the blueprint for that bridge before it, you can cross you break. to commercialisations. So I know Rob and I spent a lot of time with people speaking yeah. at the early stage. Yeah, you're breaking up. Okay, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, well, we might just leave it there then. Um, just to suggest that, yeah, strategy is key. Um, Rob and I are more than happy to assist and speak further with anyone. Uh, we have recorded this, happy to share it further. And uh, yeah, feel free to be in touch with us. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it greatly. Thanks, okay. Gareth. Thanks, Rob. Great presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot.